wir schon fertig sind. Ach so. Dr. Bismarck Ofori is busy. The GP has been working in a medical practice in Hanover for over a year. Since he arrived, significantly more patients with a migrant background have been coming here. Word has gotten out that they'll be well treated. Apparently, that's not the case everywhere. More than a quarter of the German population has a migrant background, almost 24 million people. But is everyone treated the same in the German healthcare system? Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah? Yeah. So. In Emanuel's case, the doctor was able to intervene after a clinic turned him away. Yeah. So I told the, the doctor, he saved my life. Yeah. <laughs> you are welcome every time. Yeah? <laughs> Today we're going to check again your kidney. Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A year ago, Dr. Ofori diagnosed Emanuel with third degree renal congestion the condition can quickly become dangerous. He sent him to hospital for emergency surgery. But when he arrived, he was turned away at the reception desk, even though he had all the necessary paperwork. He had to make an appointment with the urology department, he was told. He had no choice but to leave. I meet him outside the clinic in Hanover, where it happened. I was shocked. Oh, no, no, I, I stood for about two or three minutes. I don't have any possibility to go inside. So what I have to do? He saw your emergency paper? He, he saw every, the, the mobile phone and then the emergency paper. So immediately I drove back to the doctor and tell him what has happened. Dr. Afori tells me that he called the hospital to talk to the receptionist. He said it was a misunderstanding and that Emmanuel should go back. It can be so. If he had a white man, it cannot be like that. We we'll just let him go. But as a black, sometimes there's a, a, a lot of discrimination, but sometimes you have to forget and then focus what we are doing. A urine blockage can result in kidney damage. If he hadn't gone back to Dr. Ofori, Emmanuel's renal congestion could have been fatal. I write to the hospital with questions about the case. The answer, as a general rule, no one will be turned away. Someone with a medical emergency obviously isn't expected to have an appointment and won't be asked to return at a later date. But the reality is often different, says Dr. Ofori. When I want to admit a patient who doesn't have a foreign background, I rarely worry about them being turned away. Basically, never. But with someone with an African background, when I fill out the referral form, I make a mental note to follow up to call and ask if everything worked out. It's not the only example of racism in the German healthcare system. We'll be coming across others. Of course, most of us have had some bad experiences with doctors, myself included. However, it happens significantly more often to people with a migratory background. This is now backed up by the first comprehensive study on racism in the German healthcare system, commissioned by the Federal Ministry for Family Affairs and carried out by the Centre for Integration and Migration Research. The research team, led by social scientist Chihan Sinalulu, evaluated more than 21,000 questionnaires and conducted additional interviews. Überall da, wo wir die Scheinwerfer hingehalten haben, sehen wir Wherever we turned our focus, we saw problems. 
In some cases, these were glaring. For example, in terms of getting help. We also saw inequalities in terms of appointments. We as a society should be alarmed about human rights issues in an area such as health and healthcare, where lives are at stake. It's a matter of life and death. If certain groups are negatively affected, then we as a society need to be concerned. Wenn da bestimmte Gruppen negativ betroffen sind, dann sollte uns das als Gesellschaft Sorgen machen. Among the people affected in Germany are those who identify as black, Asian or Muslim. I think the healthcare system is no different from other social institutions that are only adapting to new demographic and social realities very slowly. In the areas we examined, we see that there are still structures in place that disadvantage certain groups. We want to know how this impacts people's everyday lives. We're journalists, so we ask the public via Instagram. Within a day, people are submitting detailed accounts of negative experiences. Very common. The very fact that black people are spoken to in English or Muslim women are addressed in a certain tone of voice. It happens all the time. When I arrived, the emergency doctor took one look at me, turned around, and refused to touch me. A doctor who's taken the Hippocratic Oath would have let me die. And it was because of the color of my skin. In the ambulance, the blue lights are switched off because Arabs always make a fuss about nothing. My partner doesn't speak German. In doctors' offices, he is often ignored by the staff for hours, although the doctors themselves say on their websites that they speak English. Now we only go to the doctor together. It's doubly humiliating for him not to be able to go to a doctor's office alone. Okay, dann würde ich ihn noch mal zeigen. While researching, I came across the case of Remzia. She had a problematic medical history, but was fobbed off with painkillers again and again, and not given a proper diagnosis. I tell the head of the study about her. I'm not surprised. In fact, we can also prove statistically that many Muslim women are not taken seriously. More than two-thirds of Muslim women in the study said that medical staff treat them unfairly or worse than others. This has consequences. 38.9% of Muslim women have changed doctors because they didn't feel taken seriously. Among women who are not affected by racism, the figure is 28.8%. The research shows that there are certain prejudices regarding Muslim women, that they're passive, emotional, irrational. There's also the cliché that they're very dramatic about pain, a cliché often applied to people from Turkey, especially women, is that they exaggerate their pain symptoms, or that they're hypersensitive. We visit Remzia in Lower Saxony. She seems to have been a victim of exactly this kind of thinking. Her family documented her experience. Hello. Although she was seriously ill and spent weeks in hospital, she wasn't given an accurate diagnosis. As a result, she has lasting health issues. All this has taken its toll. Today, Remzia can hardly walk and is quickly exhausted. She had to give up her job as a cleaner. She doesn't speak much German, but understands everything we say. It all began with a sudden, severe back pain in January 2021. She could hardly move and was racked by pain. In the middle of the night, her daughter called an ambulance. Ramzia was hospitalized for 10 days and diagnosed with nerve root compression syndrome. Marco. 
o çocuğun bana kalksana bir şeyin yok demesi çok What really upset me was that a nurse said to me there's nothing wrong with you get up And then everyone was saying the results show you don't have anything get up don't make such a fuss O da dedi kağıtlarda bir şey yazmıyor Meine Mutter hat mich nach My mother would call me at night during those 10 days and say they're not doing anything I'm in so much pain that I wish I could die. She was screaming in pain on the phone at night, saying, please, tell me they're doing something. I don't want to live. I can't take it anymore. They treated me like that because I'm Turkish. It wouldn't have happened to a German woman. The doctors failed to identify a life-threatening heart valve inflammation. Her heart valve? Yeah. It was hanging by a thread, you see. Severe back pain can indicate serious organ disease. That's why thorough diagnostics are so important. I write to the hospital. The family filed a written complaint. The clinic is well aware of the case. A spokesperson writes to me that there is no way of investigating how a nurse spoke to Remzia and that severe back pain is not associated with heart valve inflammation. But the renowned German heart center in Munich disagrees. Back pain might well be a symptom of heart valve inflammation. Another indication that Remzia's complaints were not taken seriously. When her pain didn't subside, the family went back to her doctor to try and get a referral for another hospital. My mother begged the doctor to admit her to another hospital. The doctor got angry and said, you're not going to hospital, there's nothing wrong with you. We were simply sent home. Selda kept all the paperwork. She contacted the practice six more times, becoming increasingly desperate. By this point, her mother had chills and fever. You can't keep fobbing off a patient, saying they just have depression, they're menopausal. I can understand that even as a general practitioner, the first thing you do is look at test results from the hospital. But if you see something is wrong, you can say, okay, I don't know, I'm going to refer you to hospital. That's not what happened. Instead, according to the family, Remzia was told over the phone by the doctor's assistant that she had depression and menopausal symptoms. It was only at the point when she could no longer eat and drink that she finally got a hospital referral from the doctor. This time she was admitted to a clinic in Hanover. Six weeks after Remzia first complained of pain, she finally got her diagnosis. Advanced heart valve inflammation. A doctor at this hospital, Hartun Karakash, who was indirectly involved with the case, posted about it on Instagram. A case of discrimination in the healthcare system that almost cost a patient her life. Unfortunately, the hospital failed to carry out sufficient tests despite high levels of inflammation. Instead, the patient was sent home with painkillers. She saw several more doctors because she was still in severe pain despite taking painkillers. She was told she was exaggerating the problem, as foreigners do. Eventually, the family hired a lawyer. They're now demanding compensation from the doctor and the hospital. But how likely are they to win their case? We have the possible treatment error during the hospital stay. They should have investigated earlier and more thoroughly. Then there's the doctor. When she heard there was a fever and chills, she should have reacted immediately. 
Only about a third of all medical malpractice cases are successful in court. Racism rarely plays a role in these lawsuits. From my perspective, there are explicit racist clichés at play here. People with a migration background supposedly exaggerate or even fake their pain. But the fact is that racism and discrimination is very difficult to prove. It's been proven that racism is an issue for people applying for apartments or jobs. But racism in the German healthcare system has not been properly investigated, even though it can be a matter of life and death. So is it just a question of individuals who, consciously or unconsciously, behave in a racist way? Or is the problem systemic? Dr. Ofori's practice in Hanover. As a general practitioner, he often uses a pulse oximeter. This measures a patient's blood oxygen saturation based on light rays that penetrate the skin. However, after years of experience, he no longer trusts the device. Does the device work the same for every patient? No, clearly not. It's often not accurate when measuring oxygen levels in people with darker skin tones. I don't always rely on it 100%. Would you use the pulse oximeter for a black patient who's short of breath? No, if a patient is short of breath, I'd say, based on these symptoms, they need a hospital checkup. Doesn't that bother you? You have dark skin yourself. What if the device doesn't work? You're right. At the end of the day, it's not optimal. But if you know that the problem exists, you can try to work around it and to do what you can so there aren't any negative surprises. A U.S. study from 2020 showed that dangerously low oxygen levels are almost three times more likely to go undetected in black patients than in white. A serious problem that became especially acute during the global COVID-19 pandemic. The reason why the pulse oximeter doesn't always give reliable readings is because it was designed for white skin, the supposed norm a prime example of structural racism in medicine. More on this later. Dr. Bismarck Ofori is aware of the obstacles his patients face and does his best to work around them. Giving a patient the attention they need when there's a language barrier, for example, is time consuming. It can take longer than the eight minutes a doctor spends on average with a patient in Germany. According to the Professional Code of Conduct for Physicians, all patients must be treated equally. But are they? A doctor might tell a patient to come back with an interpreter, even though most doctors speak English. And this can affect diagnostics? Yes, the diagnosis and how the condition develops. It gets much worse as a result. In the waiting room, we ask patients about their experiences. When you're alone with the doctor, they talk to you weirdly, like you're a foreigner. Are you taken seriously here? Yes, I'm taken seriously. That's why I feel more comfortable here. You understand more part of our problems than the others. He can explain much in English or my Chi language also he also understands. That's why I want to go to him. The recent study clearly shows the effects of racism among black patients. 62.8% feel they are treated worse than others. I think that we as all the right to be I think that we humans all have the right to be treated well by other people. We all need to be aware that we don't benefit from treating other people worse. 
It doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us stronger. It doesn't make us smarter. It just harms other people. Why does the healthcare system fail to reflect our diverse society? Even medical equipment appears to be biased, and people with acute health problems are being sent home. A system that's supposed to help everyone equally is actually putting many at risk. It's a problem that needs to be addressed at its roots. Gaps in the system start with gaps in education. Here in Rostock, a group of medical students want to change this. Bijan asked us not to use his last name. He fears the far right might target him. The problem, he says, starts with medical literature. We learn about dermatology and how disease patterns look exclusively in terms of white skin. Not all patients are going to be white. This means we can overlook diseases, misdiagnose and, in the worst case, let people die. Is there a disease where this is particularly noticeable? It's an issue with Lyme disease and also with anemia. Some symptoms are detected using a visual diagnosis, but these will look different on black skin. How they look on different skin colours is something you have to learn. How do you incorporate this knowledge? You have to look for the teaching materials, research online. Students have to make an extra effort. And if you don't have the time and energy, you don't learn it. That's an educational gap that's unacceptable. Ignorance can be dangerous. Take a rash that could indicate a dangerous disease like shingles or measles. If we overlook people, we overlook their problems, their needs. But healthcare is a basic right. We have made this our mission, at least in Germany. So far, only one medical school has adapted its teaching. In Germany, most course loads for medicine are considered too heavy already. That argument doesn't hold up. The Federal Association of Medical Students has taken a clear position. We want racism to be addressed in teaching. Bijan belongs to the student initiative Critical Medicine Rostock. They want to see the topic of racism in medicine addressed in present day, not just historically in the Nazi era. The initiative has organised a workshop on discrimination in medicine. This is the first time that the topic counts towards their degree. Everyone here says they've encountered incidents of everyday racism in hospitals. There's this term for it. Balkan or Mediterranean disease. It was used in front of me, in front of the nursing staff. Someone said of a patient who didn't speak German, who looked foreign. Oh, they're faking it, they're exaggerating. I had no idea how to respond. Did it mean I couldn't treat that patient? What was I supposed to do with that? This was a person who was in pain. Mediterranean disease, a discriminatory and racist term that's still bandied around. Doctors often pre-select patients on the basis of foreign names. The idea is, I don't want to treat that patient because they probably don't speak German. But names don't say anything about what language a patient speaks. Attitudes in medicine are only gradually starting to change, mostly due to grassroots pressure. Medicine is an old discipline, 
an elitist discipline, a white discipline. The wheels turn very slowly, but racism is sometimes very overt. We have to ask, why is change taking so long? There is no excuse for racism in today's society. That's one reason it's so hard for many to admit that it exists. While making this documentary, we often encountered closed doors when we raised the issue of racism, including at this Midwives Congress in Berlin. The press department doesn't want us at a discussion about racism. Once it's over, we talk to participant Rina Zuri. Hello. Hi, I'm Johanna Leper. Zuri tells us racism in delivery rooms isn't widely recognised as a problem. She hopes to change that. I think the word racism makes it hard. If we used the term prejudice, it would be easier to talk about. Racism is such a taboo topic. We think of right-wing extremists, neo-Nazis and violence. But there are more subtle forms. All of these midwives have witnessed racism in maternity wards. It's a place that can be highly stressful, and staff have to cope with a lot. People under stress are more likely to react in a way that's racist. Reacting in a sensitive way is not your pay grade. You're paid to look after five women at once. Your first reaction is always, oh, I wasn't being racist, not me. But then, when you dig deeper, you realize that you do have certain thought patterns instilled in you, and you start to wonder. I'd say there are colleagues who have been in the profession for a long time who don't have that self-awareness. They can be very defensive. If you talk to them, point it out to them, they'll say, I didn't mean it like that. I think it's good if clinics offer regular training courses. Again, it's a question of time and money, and ultimately hospitals' will to change. Ramzia's life hasn't been the same since her heart valve infection, she tells me. Today, she has a mechanical heart valve. The inflammation had become so bad that antibiotics didn't work. After a high-risk operation, an artery in her leg burst and she had to have emergency surgery. Since then, her right leg has been numb. She has to be careful not to strain it. That's one of the reasons why she had to give up work. I feel empty inside, useless. I have nothing to do, no work. Work was my second home. Now, it's gone. Today, she's at a checkup appointment in the same hospital where she had heart surgery. To be honest, she doesn't have hope, she says. She thinks things won't get better. She says if they had recognized her heart problem earlier, her leg would be okay. This way, please. You can put your things there. Animal tissue was inserted in Remzi's ruptured leg artery. The doctor checks that blood is circulating properly. Looks good. It's turned out well. I'm so glad. 
I can't believe there's positive news. You can see the blood circulation is fine when you press here. So great. Good news. Thank you very much. But the trauma runs deep. The family hopes their lawyer will make sure Ramzia is compensated for her suffering. All the money in the world won't bring back my mother's heart valve. For us, it's about these people being penalized. But they might not get what they want. Lawyer Maha Zelzili tells me that doctors are unlikely to apologize for medical malpractice out of court. Because if they did, their liability insurance might refuse to cover the costs. This means that they usually refrain from comment and don't apologize, in the sense of admitting responsibility. This is why patients often end up taking their cases to court. Many clients wouldn't take legal action if doctors admitted responsibility. So it's about medical malpractice, but it's also about this ignorance, this lack of sensitivity on the part of medical personnel. Remzia, for example, lost all faith in her doctor. That lack of trust is reflected in the German-wide study which shows that 12.8% of Muslim women avoid or delay seeing a doctor for fear of not being taken seriously. The figure is 6.3% for women who are not affected by racism. We see, especially in the health sector, that when someone experiences discrimination and racism, their trust disappears. We're losing these people. They're turning away from the healthcare system that's supposed to protect them. <laughs> Mirian Mann did get an apology for what happened to her. In December 2021, she went to a hospital in Frankfurt with severe stomach pain. A senior doctor saw her. He just didn't take me seriously. I told him how I was feeling. I had the impression that he wasn't taking it seriously. I kept insisting the pain wasn't normal. And he said, well, I'll be glad you're here, because with your ailments, you'd be dead by now if you were in Africa. I was upset by the idea that I should be grateful I'm allowed to be here. She grew up in Germany, but knows all too well what it's like to be perceived as different. I knew it was serious because I was in so much pain. And then he said, your German is really good. It was like he hadn't listened to anything I'd said. All he noticed was how I spoke German. And that's a problem. That's is the problem. A local politician, Mann, was so shocked that she posted a video on Instagram from the hospital. I asked him, is the pain normal? And he said, pain is never normal, but your compatriots can put up with it better than other people. It's terrible to be at the mercy of these people. They don't see you as a human being. The video got hundreds of thousands of views and a barrage of hateful comments. The doctor should put you down, you monkey. You look like a prehistoric African with that face. Are you walking upright yet or on all fours like a primate? Mann also received hundreds of messages from other people who'd experienced racism in the healthcare system. 
If it happened to me today, I'd do it again. Drawing attention to the problem is the only weapon we have against racism. That and trust that others will empathize. Her story took an unexpected turn. The doctor apologized. Man is convinced that this only happened because she's a politician. She also managed to get the hospital to organize anti-racism workshops for its staff. I see my task as pointing out what happens on an individual level, between people, when this is unacceptable and ignorant. But the problem is also structural. It's institutional. It's the universities. It's the hospitals. Black bodies have been dehumanized by colonialism. In spite of scientific progress, medicine seems in many ways to be stuck in the 1960s. Its norms no longer reflect our diverse society. But where do the strict hierarchies that make change so difficult come from? Some of the contemporary healthcare system's inequities have deep roots, as medical historian Philip Austin explains. Science can advance very quickly once there's new research, but it can take a long time for structural change to happen. In Germany, until the end of the 1960s, only a few people had the say in hospitals. They had unlimited power, and they made all the decisions. That changed in the late 60s, but it takes generations to change structures. And of course, a system in which people are earning very well is going to be very hierarchical. In dem persönliche Abhängigkeiten existieren sehr viel hierarchischer. At the Medical History Museum in Hamburg, Philipp Austin sheds light on murky chapters in the history of German medicine. Die erzählt natürlich die Geschichte der medizinischen. For example, the history of racial prejudice. Even icons of German science contributed to racist views of black people. Take renowned German physician and microbiologist Robert Koch. He conducted drug trials in a former British colony in East Africa. Many people here suffered from sleeping sickness. Koch experimented on them using a remedy containing arsenic. His goal? To gather data for the German pharmaceutical industry. Robert Koch's experiments with sleeping sickness patients led to blindness. The trials took place in what he called concentration camps. Patients were crammed together and treated until they no longer showed symptoms of the disease. People tried to escape. They were held by force. Massive force. Koch tested his remedy on more than a thousand people a day. Many died in the process. The precise figures are unknown. These experiments play a very important role in the history of the German pharmaceutical industry. It was a precursor to antibiotics. An active ingredient is still in use today. A Nobel Prize winner, Robert Koch, conducted research that treated black patients as subhuman. There is early evidence of this idea that black people are insensitive to pain. It was a factor in the debate about the legitimacy of slavery. The idea was widespread at the time that black people were insensitive to pain. It was used to justify physically harming them. There were already scientific arguments against that idea that said people's sensitivities are all the same, but these ideas persisted.
and they remain damaging, as illustrated by Miriam Mann's case. The problem of racism in the German healthcare system has come to the attention of the Hamburg Chamber of Physicians. President Pedram Emami says it's starting to be discussed. I think that in the healthcare system as a whole, we often have difficulty embracing change, but to a certain extent, we're a mirror of society. In society as a whole, we don't always find it easy to deal with painful questions. This means that we need perseverance for the future. It certainly won't be easy. The organization now has an anti-racism counseling center. Cases of discrimination are reported from all over Germany, in particular by doctors with problems at work. Dr. Amami favors a gentle approach. I think it's very difficult, not only for those affected, but also for those who act in racist ways, knowingly or not. It's not always easy to be confronted with it. That's exactly why I think we need to be careful with our criticism. We need to strike the right tone so we don't alienate people. Otherwise, nothing will change. People will become increasingly polarized. For Remzi's family, any change is already too late. The damage caused is irreversible. It's still not clear whether she'll ever get the apology she wants. People should be listened to, no matter where they come from. No one should be pushed aside. All I want is my health. Her faith in Germany's healthcare system has been shaken for good. <laughs>